All right. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it. Um, my talk today uh, will be about uh, how to build web applications using microservices and Node.js and uh, serverless uh, AWS. Um, the, the more I dive into microservices, the, the more it reminds me of, of a joke uh, that every program can be written in one line of code that has a bug. Well, I hope my, my presentation is better than my jokes. <laughs> so uh, this talk is actually evolution of a presentation that I had last month at the AWS conference in uh, Vegas. Uh, where we talk about microservices uh, architecture for, for digital platforms using Lambda, CloudFront, and DynamoDB. Uh, let me see how many of, of you guys are using AWS today. OK. Anyone is using Lambda? Node inside Lambda? All right. OK. So you help me out. Um, the <laughs> The main, uh, the fundamental role of every every application or digital platform is, uh, you know, to be up and running 24/7. Uh, but if any of you work for, I don't know, like Buzzfeed here, or New York Media, or I, I don't think Flipkart anyone, but uh, you most probably had the experience recently, a high level of pressure and stress. Uh, I know for a fact from uh, for BuzzFeed it was uh, caused by the uh, traffic peak uh, on the, this article. Does anyone know or have seen this? What's the color of this dress? Yep. Um, in case of uh, New York uh, Magazine, it was caused by the, uh, an attack led by uh, an extremist group of individuals. Uh, that brought down their website for, for just a couple of days, I think, or a couple of hours. I don't remember exactly. Uh, in case of Flipkart, it was uh, a launch of a low-cost smartphone uh, that a lot of customers in India wanted, and they uh, came and decided at the same time. Um, let me see if any, any, any one of you had uh, similar experiences where you had outages for your applications, websites, digital platforms? No? Well, yeah. It, uh, well, I personally experienced something like this back in 2009 uh, when uh, Michael Jackson died and I was working for a media agency. I know it's kind of uh, weird, but I was working at a media agency and the traffic peak brought down our entire platform. And it wasn't a very pleasant discussion with my manager. Um, it is a big concern for, for us that 87% of attacks uh, affect digital platforms. I don't know if you guys are aware, but the average uh, downtime costs companies hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars an hour. Not to mention about damage in reputation and credit ratings, right? customer churn and insurance increases. Right. So. Um, the main question is, is there something that we can easily do to solve these problems? And obviously, I'll try to put it in the context of Node.js. Uh, so we've been doing it for a while, like helping customers. Uh, either it's a business owners, decision makers, technical, non-technical, uh, developers, or architects uh, to improve their uh, web applications and digital platforms. That's how we ended up building this abstract, using the abstracted services from AWS, and building a platform as a service that we call digital enterprise end-to-end -end platform. My name is Eugene Estradi. I'm a technology partner at Mitel Group. Uh, I've been in IT for over 15 years, and uh, with the last seven years working mainly with AWS. Uh, I'm a certified solution architect worked at companies like uh, Hearst, Amazon, uh, Grubhub, when it was still a startup, uh, and now it's a public company, in Tenaris. Mito Group is a web development studio that focuses on the, uh, enterprise applications and platforms. Um, 
We are official AWS technology partner, and we're working with mainly media entertainment companies. So uh, the agenda for today, we'll try to talk about the web applications, how to run them on AWS. Uh, I will dive into uh, microservices uh, next. And at the end, I'll try to allocate some time. Hopefully, I'll have this is kind of constrained in time uh, to questions to Q&A. Okay. So my goal today uh, is to show you through hands-on uh, the value of the microservices. Uh, at the end of this talk, I will demo uh, some steps from our development process, how we, um, how we run code based on this example, like a to-do app. Uh, because the provisioning, it takes some time. Uh, it's combined uh, with uh, how much uh, AWS, how much time it takes to provision some of their services. I'll try to sh start with uh, starting provisioning those things that uh, takes a lot of time. And then we'll go with the discussion. Hopefully by the time when we get into the hands-on, it will be already provisioned. Okay? All right. So... Let me go over here. Um, sorry, let me just switch. Um, so I'll go to the uh, GitHub repository. That's where we have this microservice, uh, the application bundled as a microservice. And I'll go I'll follow step by steps from the, uh, um, from the getting started uh, documentation. So I have it open here. If you scroll down, you have here getting started. Uh, we've built our own CLI, which we called from Digital Enterprise End-to-End -end Platform. It's Deep CLI, and we name it DeepFi. So I will skip the first step, and, the, and I'll just go with the second one. Is anyone here who doesn't know how to install a Node.js package? OK. Um, so, git clone, oh, sorry, just to be credible, I'll remove the previous version. So I downloaded the application and Let it uh, start the server because it needs to compile. And let's go to the presentation. So, um, what is the reference architecture of any web application if you guys are using it on AWS? Generally speaking, it's the same on other cloud providers if you do it in your uh, data centers, hybrid clouds, and so on and so forth. So. Um, it's, um, let me see by a show of hands if uh, whoever is using AWS, if he's using something similar. No? Okay, so I'll try to go into not too, too much details, but it's, it's basically you have a front end layer that you run some servers, you have a back end layer that you run some other servers, and then you have a database, right, as we saw in the previous talk. Um, so on, on AWS, it, the, the AWS provides you all these uh, services like uh, Elastic Compute Service or EC2 uh, and all the IAM, uh, the VPC and so on to make it secure, right? And um, that's the reference architecture. If you go to aws.amazon.com slash architecture, uh, you'll see this uh, as a reference for web applications. The, the context here is that because it runs across multiple availability zones, which means it actually physical, different physical data centers, right? Uh, there is, um, it spins across different physical data centers, it uh, runs your application there. Uh, that's why it's very, um, uh, the, the scale of, from a scalability standpoint of view, it takes a couple of minutes to launch new servers so you can uh, meet the demand of your application. But if you have experienced something that I talked about in the beginning, breaking news or viral content or some attacks that run on your application, 
a couple of months ago, GitHub had several of them. You guys remember? Okay, yeah, I see that. Uh, then you know that just scaling the minutes, it's not enough. By the time you scale your infrastructure, you're already down. Right? Uh, you end up, and we ended up, building our own uh, additional operation, additional tools uh, to be able to scale faster than that. Um, it is this architecture on AWS, it makes it very easy to maintain and support. So less operations makes the platform and the application less complex. But it still requires very experienced DevOps engineers to, to do so. Um, as developers, you can choose whatever language or whatever technology tools you, you can use. Right? It can be uh, Java or C Sharp. It can be Python or Ruby, uh, Scala or Go. It can be JavaScript or JavaScript. <laughs> you guys are. You tired? <laughs> okay, no way. Uh, but it, we still had to uh, hire and recruit uh, very skilled engineers uh, with a rich skill set uh, to do uh, to manage the entire full stack. Right? Uh, last but not the least, it is cost effective. Right? I don't want to go into a lot of discussions of uh, why it's cost effective. Uh, we can take it offline if you guys are not convinced. Um, but if you only implement it properly, you pay only for what you use, right? Uh, but when the infrastructure doesn't scale fast enough in order to meet the spiking demands, uh, the engineering teams tend to over-provision, right? In order to solve their short-term problems uh, and buy time uh, to, th to, have, to think of uh, how to solve uh, the long-term, uh, to find the long-term solutions, right? Anyone here did it before? Over-provisioning? Yeah? Okay. Okay, I'm not the only one. Um, so while we're trying to solve these problems, two major th uh, things happened um, that changed everything. That uh, last year, Amazon launched uh, AWS Lambda, which for those of you who are not familiar, it's an event-driven computing service for dynamic applications. And it was launched with Node.js. That's why the whole context is around Node.js. And this year, at the summit, uh, AWS launched Amazon API Gateway, a fully managed service for scalable API endpoints. So these two services enabled us to reinvent the architecture from a reference one, the one that I described before, into a serverless architecture. So uh, let's see what is a serverless architecture. Um, what does it mean? So intuitively, there should be something that has no servers, right? You guys agree? OK. Um, well, it is. The fact is that developers don't need to deal and don't need to think of how to provision those servers and how to do all these associated operations and um, uh, to keep them up and running, especially at scale. Right? Uh, instead, developers get abstracted services right, that are highly secure and highly available. They are pre-scaled and pre-provisioned, right? which means that you don't need to worry about the either under-provisioning or over-provisioning. Right? It's provided with the service. So the main question, how can we get something that runs on the reference architecture into this serverless approach? So I'll try, I'll try to show you how we did it layer by layer. And that probably will be something that I'll try to skip. Well, first question is how do we transform the web tier into a serverless one? Uh, let me see by a show of hands how many of you used S3 or simple storage service. OK, so uh, most of us think of S3 as a storage service, right? Available over the internet. We personally, we think of S3 as a cluster of web servers that are behind load balancers and that has uh, the, the disabled with the server-side scripting module, modules disabled, right? So what it means is that you cannot run anything on the server side. 
but you can run it in the client side, correct? So it is secure through IAM, which is identity and access management from, from AWS, and there is no need to worry about the underlying infrastructure. I'll try to skip some of these slides because I have a feeling that uh, I won't have time uh, trying to fit in, into the, the, the time here. Uh, but generally speaking, when we transform this, think of what generally runs in any web application, right? Statics, uh, static components, uh, they, they remain the same. So JavaScript, um, uh, images, videos, documents. Um, we also take the HTML and put it on S3. Right? Because S3 doesn't allow the server-side scripting, we're using client-side languages like JavaScript to add dynamic functionality. Right. So modern JavaScript frameworks like AngularJS or ReactJS, right, they caught up a lot lately to other popular web frameworks. Right. They provide, so you get the similar patterns as Django on, on Python, right. uh, Symfony or Yi on PHP, right. um, Ruby on Rails, and so on. Right. And they are very friendly with search engines. I don't know how many of you are very f familiar with that, uh, uh, search engines like Google. They index uh, Ajax, they index JavaScript, they index everything that runs on the client side. Right? And Bing is catching up. Um, uh, sorry, I forgot the, the Chinese one. Uh, Baidu, yeah, yeah, and so on. Um, but the biggest benefit, it is completely serverless. So the infrastructure comes pre-scaled at the AWS size, which means it's in virtually in, uh, it's in, 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 virtually infinite. Right? Uh, I have some people. I have heard some people saying that uh, you will reach your budget faster than AWS will reach its physical limits. And the bigger it is, the better it gets, and the lower it costs. So the most important for our talk is uh, the app tier. So how do we transform the reference architecture for the back end from reference to a serverless one? Right? So AWS Lambda can roughly be described as a Node.js environment running in a Docker container. Right? Um, it deploys in milliseconds and executes code in seconds. So the same way, like in case of the web tier, it is secure through identity and access management, and you don't need to worry about the infrastructure. So because the, the way Lambda is designed, uh, we get out of the box an accelerated backend that has very short time to live. So the only thing that you care, you write a very small Node.js function. Right? You load it into Lambda, and then you consume it through API Gateway. Right. All right. And in case like a web tier, it is completely serverless, the same benefits. Uh, last but not the least, how to transform a database tier. Um, we, we use DynamoDB, and we encourage everyone to use DynamoDB, mainly because the only thing that you as a developer care about is reads per second and writes per second. And again, like in case of the web tier and app tier, it is secure through IAM, and you don't need to worry about the infrastructure. I keep repeating infrastructure, infrastructure. I'm not sure how many of you been in a, in a DevOps position or exposed to the infrastructure. And from my experience, I can tell you it was taking me 80% of my time, and I'm a developer by nature. Right. So just thought of it. So DynamoDB is a schemaless or NoSQL database like MongoDB or CassandraDB. Uh, let me see how many of you are using or been exposed to DynamoDB. Yeah, it's, uh, if you think of uh, how CassandraDB works, this is the most appropriate, uh, the most uh, similar, uh, but again, MongoDB, like key value database, right? 
Um, you as a developer, the only thing you need to think about, the only uh, operation that you worry is how to increase or decrease reads or writes, and then I go independently. Okay. But at scale, by itself, DynamoDB could be very cost intensive. So uh, the value of cloud providers like AWS is when they go together with other services. Right? Uh, we, uh, I think it was Shazam. Does, is anyone familiar with Shazam? Yeah. So Shazam was the first customer, or first AWS customer, who wrote a paper on how to use DynamoDB cost effectively. Right? They put SQS, or virtually put SQS in front of DynamoDB. So in other words, they put the queue in front of a database, and for use cases where you can offload your rights, where you don't need a strong consistency, uh, they use the queue. Right? And the same way for, uh, for reads, they put an uh, memcache or Redis. Right? Um, again, it's completely serverless, the same benefits as in the front end and back end. And, but if you, for some reason, are tied to relational databases, and uh, you cannot use a, a key value pair um, database like DynamoDB, you can use our RDS Aurora, which comes exactly in the same serverless approach. You don't need to worry about the infrastructure, underlying infrastructure. All right. Well, I hope you guys are excited enough and too much talking, so let's go to something, to a demo. So the first demo, I will show you how to set up it manually uh, in the application that will be running in the serverless uh, environment. Okay. So uh, I'll go through these five steps. And um, what I was saying that uh, CloudFront, which is the content distribution network, uh, takes most of time. It takes almost 15 minutes. So if it's not done uh, by the time I'm done with the demo, I'll show you directly uh, how it looks from, from S3. Cool? All right. Let's see. So this is still part of the pre pre-warming. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I have here my AWS account. So as I said, let me switch back and forth. First thing that you need to worry about anywhere is security. And security at every layer. I uh, will set up an uh, identity and access management role in order to be able to use it with these services. So if you go to identity and access management, you go to roles, create a new role. So I will be mindful of the time, and I'll just set up the, only the most important. But you, uh, if you are interested, we can have a conversation afterwards. Uh, the IEM is managed. Uh, UI handles a lot of things for you, but it doesn't mean that it happens magically. Right? You have to think that uh, if you want to have the flexibility to set up security and manage security, you go back to IEM and you uh, adapt some of the roles that the service creates for you. So in this case, I want to give access to my backend, from my backend to the database. So I will call it Lambda to Dynamo. DB demo lambda to DynamoDB. First thing I need to set up: what is the service that I'm giving access to? Dynamo uh, lambda, and the second one, AWS has a predefined policies, so you can choose one of this. Oh, sorry. Lambda invocations and create the role. Second step, I want to go to S3 and create the bucket for my application. So I'll call it the same, demo to, uh, to do app. You can select the region. What's important to keep in mind where you run one of the applications, let's say S3 runs in, in the east region, you have to use everything in the same region. Right? If it goes across regions, you might either have issues or you might have latency. 
Okay. All right. In order to enable Dynamo uh, S3 to run as a web server, there is a feature here called static website hosting. Index.html, error.html. Okay. And we will need this one for CloudFront. And last but not the least, update the code. I have my code here, but in order not to load it file by file, just enable this enhanced uploader. Come on. All right, add items. Oh, Houston, we have a problem. Okay, I will move on. Uh, I'll upload the, the code at the end. Let me go to, oh, that's, have you guys seen this before? Take a picture. This happens very, very, uh, <laughs> sorry? <laughs> Maybe that's why it doesn't work. It's weird. Um, okay, I guess the manual step. So what I'm trying to, to do, I'm trying to show you the manual step and you see how tedious it is. And then I'll try to show you the developer style where you go with a black screen, you type something and the magic happens. Right? Um, distribution. Uh, what's important here to remember if you like the UIs is that um, as the origin, CloudFront is very flexible. So when you click here, it shows you the list of the buckets, and that's the tendency to select the bucket that you just created. Uh, you should go back actually to, to S3 and not just specify the bucket, but provide the, the endpoint to S3. And you see it changes the UI because now it's a custom uh, custom distribution. Uh, the path, it says like this. Uh, we can enable here also the option. And you can specify the C name if you want to have something under your subdomain. Or and everything else, uh, default root is important, uh, default root object. And there it is. So this one takes about 15 minutes. Uh, the next step is Lambda. Lambda, again, a couple of clicks. Uh, a demo, retrieve, Lambda. And you see it supports Node.js. If somebody is more familiar or loves Java or Python, you guys can use it. And um, uh, I'm Pretty sure the database works for try to add other languages as well, but let's stick with Node.js. Here is the I am policy that I created. So when I upload the Lambda, it wraps into this security uh, context that will allow you to make call from Lambda to DynamoDB and nothing else. If you guys try to make a call to something else, uh, the, the code without providing specific uh, credentials will not allow you. So you'll, uh, your, your calls from Node.js will fail. Uh, AWS related, I mean. If something is outside, yeah, you still need to provide that. Um, so at the conference, AWS announced that the, now the timeout of, uh, of the, um, uh, you can go up to five minutes to execute the Lambda function. Yeah. It was the, uh, supposed to be the code to front end, the front end code. Okay. It's the HTML, file. HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and so on and so forth. Yes. Yeah. So basically the, static the static website, yes, that contains the uh, JavaScript. And the static website in this case can be you can use AngularJS and write an AngularJS app. You can write the ReactJS app. 
uh, anything you want, right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, upload Lambda. And I have it somewhere here provided. AWS app. Oops, sorry, it's wrong lambda. Uh, yeah, <laughs> something is, is wrong. I need to debug it. Anyway, um, I apologize. Apparently, I have some, uh, some technical issues. Uh, I will continue with, with the presentation, um, and uh, I'll try at the end. If somebody will want to stay around here with me with, to debug it, <laughs> we'll be doing it real time. Um, so I apologize for that. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, I, I usually hate when people put the video and shows you the video, but I have all these steps uh, put in the video, and I can send you the link at the end. So uh, if you guys... Uh, still interested how to do it in the UI manually. Okay. Do you have an existing solution that's got to be uploaded already? Maybe you can just point out where the file is. Uh, yes. Thank you. And I actually have it open over here. So it's that URL to do.deep.mg is the actual website that has the front end, the back end, database, everything wrapped up. And that's, that's actually what I want to show with you at the end. I'll have this clone of this application, this website, uh, deployed in my own AWS account. Okay. All right. So let's move. Sorry. Let's move forward. Uh, some lessons learned is um, um, for, for JavaScript developers and Node developers, it's a... Uh, uh, it's very challenging to to get developers to uh, code in terms of um, um, sorry as a service is oriented architecture right so for for us uh, having not having alternatives uh, because front end is completely decoupled from that back end and you don't have a framework that you say okay I can tweak I don't need to make an API call to something. I will just make direct call to my backend, and I'll just skip all this step because the API endpoint adds additional complexity and so on. Like uh, you can do in Django, or you can do in uh, Symfony, or you can do in any other of those frameworks. Okay. Um, and having that, having not having alternatives to services-oriented architecture and uh, uh, APIs, uh, put everybody on the team to commit and start building your application, respecting the API, respecting the SOA. Okay. And services, building services also means that, SOA means that we're building services. But a service on Lambda uh, is restricted or is constrained by design to 300 seconds execution time and 1.5 gig of uh, memory. Okay. So uh, not to mention some the browser limitations. Also, uh, Camila was talking about different, uh, different operating systems. Uh, you have issues that you need to, to, keep, to keep in mind. That's how we ended up in building it in a microservices approach. Okay. So before we go into microservices, let's recap. This is the reference architecture. And this is the serverless architecture, trans transformed to serverless architecture. Okay? So now let's get to the cherry on the top of the cake, microservices architecture. So a lot of people think of microservices as Docker. Right? And it's true, but it's not only Docker. <laughs> um, in a nutshell, it's an architectural pattern for software. Right? that can be applied nowadays almost anywhere. Right? Either we're talking about the infrastructure, or we're talking about the platform level, or we're talking about the application level. Right? 
Think of it like a shredder of the monoliths, right? where uh, it makes complex into simple and it makes difficult into easy. Obviously, it comes with other complexities, which I'll try to cover uh, in this presentation. But if it's software driven, it could be designed as a microservice. Right? That's what I would like you guys to keep in mind after this presentation. Uh, it's a new trend that is very popular. A lot of people are curious about and excited. Uh, my favorite speakers are these three guys, uh, Adrian Cockroft, uh, Martin Fowler and Sam Newman. By the way, at the end, I'll send you the, 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 uh, the slides presentation so you guys can have it as well. So I mentioned Adrian Cockroft for two reasons. So as a former chief architect of Netflix, Adrian, uh, he basically pioneered and evangelized microservices uh, everywhere. Right? And in his presentation, uh, State of the Art and Microservices, Adrian is talking about how to speed up applications. Right? The milliseconds uh, in deployment time and the seconds in execution time made us to be early adopters of AWS Lambda, running Node.js. So let's see in microservices architecture for uh, for using AWS Lambda as a, as a backend. So this is one of the use cases that we have, a diagram, and it's a third iteration of our deployment workflow. Right? Which, by the way, the first, the first two uh, iterations, we completely messed up. If you guys are curious about that, I'll well, talk, talk to me at the end, and I'll tell you some of the embarrassing things. Uh, so back to this to the third iteration, the context here is that we are building a digital asset management system for some of our customers and had a lot of assets, microsites, or static websites uh, that we helped them to migrate to AWS just with one click right, in UI. Right? The source code were somewhere in GitHub or Subversion or somewhere on their internal infrastructure. So either way, we have built a series of lambdas that are working in like a workflow powered by Node.js again. <laughs> uh, that first, it takes the raw file, it puts in one S3 bucket, then it triggers uh, another lambda that does the processing, the extract, transform, load, takes some of the metadata, puts in DynamoDB, or, and then uh, takes some other stuff, puts in S3 again. Uh, and uh, the third, uh, it moves that raw file after it's processed, it moves it to the final bucket. Okay. Uh, I will skip the next couple of slides because it talks about Lambda and Lambda and Lambda. I'm pretty sure you guys would like to hear and you'd like to see some of the t tips and tricks, uh, how to work with... Um, uh, with, with AWS Lambda, as well as um, uh, to see my final, the, the demo, how to make it automatic. Right. So uh, Lambda is pretty pretty uh, young uh, service, right? It's about one year old. So um, expect the unexpected, and uh, in order to be able to work with it, just put some uh, metrics around it. Right? Um, put, and put some around uh, some alarms. Sorry, not metrics. Alarms on the metrics. You'll thank me later for that. Uh, also, uh, we were lucky enough to reach thresholds uh, of S3, which uh, my experience at AWS. I never, in my seven years working with AWS, I never been able to do that. Uh, which is very, very rare. And obviously, be, be aware of, of uh, infinite loops. Um, the official documentation also states it very, very clearly. Uh, try to think architecturally that, that you don't uh, 
put into the so you don't trigger an infinite loop on the lambda executions. Um, and uh, we didn't do it with one lambda. We had a couple of uh, two guys working on three different lambdas, and obviously they didn't talk to each other. Uh, and uh, they ended up in one was calling uh, one of the lambdas. It was the, the processing execution. It was calling back the other lambda. And we obviously had an infinite loop, uh, which uh, took some time to debug it and figure it out. Uh, sounds scary, but it's it's not. Once you go through, don't go through the same experience. Just take my experience and do uh, uh, learn on top of that. Uh, microservices are also game changers that enable speed and security, because it is much harder to figure out how to attack something that leaves, uh, that quickly disappears. Right? It's counterintuitive, but it's true. Um, but if you're coming from a monolithic architecture, uh, a practical approach would be just build a service or a feature first, and then take it, break it down into microservices. So this will be probably the last slides. If you're coming from a monolithic architecture, you have a lot of developers that does the same process, right? and sometimes steps on each other on the toes. Microservices architecture empowers and enables developers to be independent from each other. Right? Self-sufficient, highly decoupled, and focused on small and simple tasks. Well, I personally love it, and I would never go back to monoliths ever, hopefully. So this is my last slide. So I'll go back to the... Uh, to the to this application, this demo application, and try to explain what I've done uh, prior to um, at the beginning. Right? So as I said, we we've built a framework that we've open sourced. It's actually it's not a framework; it's just a collection of Node.js libraries. Right? If you go uh, here, uh, you will uh, see. So this is the URL. Um, Again, I'll provide you guys at the end. Um, uh, and we build a CLI in order to make it easier for us to execute all these steps. Um, and uh, we just open sourced so anyone who will be who will want to use it, and they don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, the the concept behind it is that a developer should be able to work by themselves on their machine, even if they don't have internet connection or Wi-Fi or so on. So that's the the reason why we have a server, and that's the way, uh, the reason why we abstracted everything which runs and simulating everything locally. Simulate Lambda, we simulate the API gateway, we simulate the front end, uh, and we simulate the database. So we're using uh, some um, Node.js library from Medium, uh, that uh, it's a Node.js wrapper for the local DynamoDB. Um, that being said, developers work, build their own uh, applications. Uh, I should scroll down probably uh, lower, and you can see the layout of this particular application. And that's what we, we have for some other examples that we build and put it out there. So you can have an understanding. Uh, we're not trying to reinvent anything. We're using from the front end already popular uh, um, frameworks like AngularJS. Uh, we're using AngularJS, but the developers can use ReactJS, Backbone, Ember, anything that you like, that you're more comfortable. And on the, on the, on the back end, we're mainly using Node.js and NPM to do the deployments. Okay? So let me go through, through this step and just explain what, uh, what, what, what's happening. So the first step is uh, I launched the application locally. Let me open in a different browser. So DP5, server, and then specify where the source of uh, microservices are collected. Um, as you can see, NPM update. Uh, it, if I run the second time, just does uh, update. The first time it does the NPM install and takes a little bit. So right now it says that it's 
up and running. So I'll go to localhost 800, and there you go. You have your application running locally on your, uh, on your account. And you don't need AWS credentials for, for this. It just simulates everything. Yeah. So, yeah, can. I know if you're anyone familiar with todomvc.com. So that's basically the implementation of todomvc.com on, on our framework. So uh, there you go. You have as a terminal, so you can see how much time it takes to execute and so on and so forth. And the last step is uh, it has an, uh, the execution failed. The role defined for the task cannot be assumed by Lambda. Huh. Uh, something is wrong with the API, with Lambda API. Um, if I... Ah. Ah, uh, sorry, I need to debug it. <laughs> so let me let me try let me try to do exactly the same on one that I already have. Typify deploy source. So as a developer, you have you're running on your local machine, you build your application or your microservice. Right. Now you're comfortable, okay, let me try to see how it runs in production. And that's the, the next step of uh, DPFI deploy. It takes whatever you have locally, uh, or it takes whatever you have in your GitHub account, and then it deploys into your AWS account. What I'm trying to show here is that uh, um, after when you run the, uh, the AWS, uh, DPFI deploy, it takes everything... Uh, all the configurations that you already have set up for your AWS account. And it takes your application that you develop and it runs in this uh, uh, standard environment or stable environment that if I work on this application and you work on this application, we can uh, have in the development environment. And, uh, so the development environment is actually the production environment, is a staging environment. There is no questions about uh, is there any difference between what you're running and what I'm running. Right? Um, and that's the, the power of the serverless environments uh, running on, on AWS. And so uh, also, you have uh, NPM, right? In NPM, you define the dependencies. There are production dependencies and there are development dependencies because we have the NP in the NPM specified the local DynamoDB, uh, the local Lambda, right? Um, uh, sorry, guys, I didn't clean up the... I was extending that. I cannot show it to you, but... Oh. Apologies. Uh, in the end, what you end up is uh, having this application running in your AWS account that you own. And um, the, the value proposition here is that you can now start working with other developers that you don't need to ask them um, uh, to set up their environment uh, to your specifications, uh, as well as it can be globally distributed teams that works on the same application without uh, tap, uh, uh, tapping on the sto toes on the each other, and you're actually collaborating together. Okay. Apologize, the demo failed. So. <laughs> so we talk about the microservices architecture powered by AWS Lambda and Node.js, and then some of the tips and tricks that uh, we learned by, by ourselves.
Sure. Um, good question. Let me show you. So I didn't go through the through the uh, structure of a microservice, but basically you have uh, I have here in my application two microservices, um, and then a microservice is divided into we we couple into the same uh, in the same code base the front end, back end, database, security, and other stuff. Right. So obviously uh, uh, the back end is the one that is responsible with for the work with Node.js. Um, we have the resources just, sorry? Oh. Is it better? All right. So we have a resources JS that basically mapping between for each of the, uh, that particular microservice or you can call it my micro application uh, that maps to each of the, all the lambdas. Uh, it can be lambda or it can be something that is external that goes through the API gateway. So API Gateway supports Lambda and supports external API endpoints. So it can be something that you already have right now as a web services or APIs that you're using in your application that can go through this. And the structure of one Lambda function is um, you basically have a bootstrap JS that goes here and uh, this is, uh, so we're using um, uh, we have the standard that uh, we go, we're using ES6, and we're using Babel to, to transpile it back to um, Node.js uh, 0, 10, because that's what Lambda currently supports. Uh, and uh, I, I know that they are working on to supporting multiple versions of, of Lambda, and uh, with uh, uh, Node.js 4 having the lifetime uh, support, uh, that my prediction is that uh, that will be the what the, they will go next that the uh, enable. Okay, so um, you get here. Uh, you have the Bootstrap. You import. We're importing the deep framework, and then we're importing the handler. So this is kind of standard in order to be able to to execute the lambda. In lambda, you can either load one file and call it index.js like it was in the previous uh, presentation, or uh, the way we have it, it's uh, wrapped up as a standard, and then in handler.js you can have, uh, sorry, let me show this one. In handler.js you can have your particular uh, node function, right? So in this case, we have uh, everything that it does, this application, it uh, creates, a connection, uh, creates a record into DynamoDB, right? So, well, uh, it loads, uh, from the kernel, it loads the, the, uh, the library that is responsible for the database, and then it gets the table, the to-do table, right? and then it creates the item in the to-do table. Right? Um, I have to say that, um, uh, so we got to, to this point by abstracting almost every layer. So the, the front end, when we are referring to the front end, we don't call it just make a call to S3, although we are using AWS as JavaScript SDK or Node.js SDK, uh, we have a, a database um, a library, a Node.js library that we call uh, DeepFS, right? So we're calling it as we are making something from the file system. Uh, in terms of a Lambda, we are referring it to the resources. So it's deep resource that uh, you make a call to the resource, and the resource can be a lambda, a resource can be an API uh, gateway endpoint, the resource can be anything else that you abstract. On the long term, our vision, and I, I don't want to sound that, uh, although I'm a former AWS employee, that we're working only with AWS, it's that my experience and our team's experience, but uh, on the long term, we're thinking to support additional cloud providers. That the customer, when they come to, uh, to use this, um, they choose, and they say, I want this collection of microservices. Uh, we resolve all the dependencies for, for them, and it loads into their cloud provider account. It can be a Google Cloud, it can be a Microsoft Azure, and so on. Sorry, I deviated, but <laughs> did I answer your question? Yes, exactly. So it's smart enough to like know to take that and like provision out stuff for 
Yeah, that's uh, that's what DP5 does. So before it deploys that into Lambda, it calls all the dependencies, it compiles all the dependencies, it transforms with Babel from ES6 to ES5. Once the node 4 will be supported, we we'll most probably will drop it and just, because it adds a little bit of the uh, additional code into Lambda. And uh, the trick with AWS Lambda uh, right now is the smaller the function is, the faster it gets executed. They need to download, they need to unzip it, and they need to, uh, so, it, does it make sense? Yes, please. How it happens, it's magic. <laughs> the reality is no, they don't. Uh, they, actually, there is an article that talks about how you can reuse the same, uh, the same container. But each one of those methods you showed is a separate microservice. Yes, yes. For, for us, it's a, se a separate Lambda function that we load in, uh, and we call from, uh, from AWS Lambda. But from a, from a conceptual point of view, as an architecture, Yes, that's a separate microservice, and we have six different microservices for the backend. It's a good call. Yeah. <laughs> Very few people call me on that. <laughs> Other questions? All right. Thank you, guys.